Oh, and as well, do you know what coal, coal farm shells are? The little warm leaves that you see, the white and the purple leaves. That a lot of times I'll consider Iroquois because Iroquois have all, all of their long shells, but we also made them as well because we ate a lot of palm shells. <laughs> Find them and then use them. So just keep this in mind this water, um, living in the water as we go on. Can you hear me on the computer? Okay. So I want to talk about sort of how we came on this to these seven communities or seven tribes. And it's really through our mandala, which is what this is, or a tribal insignia. It's on everything. So after the talk, you can come up here and see some of the things I have. We have it on our letterhead, we have it on our flag, we have it on you know, business cards, everything is what we use to sort of signify who we are and what people know visually that we're talking about. It also signifies where we came from and what it means to be a good brother town member. So the seven tracks are each one of the colors at the bottom. So it's signified by one of the feathers at the bottom. Then you have, do you see the bird? <laughs> yes. So this is an eagle, which just like in American culture, right, our larger culture, it signifies bravery and honor and power. Within the eagle, you have a cross. And that's because we are what is called a Christian tribe. It's not sounds like an oxymoron. You know, having a native community that claims Christian identity. But when we're talking about the brother town, we're talking about a group of people that made first contact. So we really mean one of the first groups to make contact, right? With white settlers that came over. So we have a long period of assimilation than most other tribes. And what does this mean? It means that we've been Christian longer than the US has been a country, which is amazing. Yeah? I was born. So pretty quickly after contact, we Christianized, and we started speaking English, which I will come back to when we talk about language. So the cross indicates that we are a Christian tribe. We don't force our members to, to be one Christian denomination over another. We don't have to do this or follow these purposes. But what we do do is that in, before any meeting or gathering or feast that we have, we do pray to some creator, um, which is a nice way to bring us together as a community. Okay. There we go. Within the Christian cross, you see one other symbol that also looks like a cross. So the Christian cross is the white outline, and within it is what is called the Calumet cross. And it signifies not only the Christian background, but also our native background. It was designed by one of our tribal members, whose name was Ruby Ottery. And the horizontal part of the, of the cross is this here. Nope, sorry, that's the vertical part. The vertical part is this sphere <laughs> because we are coastal dwellers, right? And we, we um, use fishing as our livelihood. And then the vertical part, horizontal. Wow, I'm really struggling with vertical and horizontal. The, the horizontal part is actually how you meant or a pipe. Okay. So I wanted to switch over to our migration history and introduce one of our most famous tribal members. I think you're all familiar or relatively familiar with the history of colonialism in this country and how native and US relations are that. And we continue to hold that, right? But it was under colonial circumstances such as disease and assimilation and war that that seems to be a long way to be tried to work in some of the leadership of the United States and the So that I get as much history as possible. So this is Stamps and Maka. He pictured on the, your left, in his younger days, in traditional Pequot clothing, and on the right, in his older years, after he has traveled the world, right? He was the son of a Mashantucket Pequot mother and a Mohegan father. He was a devout Christian and believed the only way to save his people was to bring the surrounding tribes who were facing the same difficulties as the Mohegans and the Pequots together and for them to lead Christian lives. 
Occam is remembered fondly by a lot of people, including tribal members, but that isn't to say that we can't also be critical of Occam and his quest to Christianize and Europeanize our ancestral tribes. He was doing what he thought was best, so we don't begrudge him this. But you'll see later in my presentation that many of the decisions made on behalf of our tribe in the best interest of our tribe was also, had also a lot of consequences. This is nothing that we all don't already know, and I'm sure many of you can think of examples in your own life. But today, Occam is remembered fondly because he tried to do something very noble other than bring all our tribes together, which was start an Indian school. I'm not talking about a boarding school like Henry Pratt started in the early 1900s that had the slogan, quote, kill the Indian, save the man. I'm talking about an actual university setting that was meant to educate Indian students primarily. So Occam traveled to England to raise money for this school. But his professional partner, Eliezer Wheelock, who was Iroquois, stayed here in the US, took the money Occam had raised to make the school, still built it, but didn't admit any Indian students. And that school today is one of our oldest Ivy League schools we have. Do you want to take a guess? You don't even know? No, I don't. <laughs> it's Dartmouth College. Yeah, very prestigious school. So one of the great things that of Brother Town members together and sort of starts prior to Occam is just how educated Brother Town members are. We have two people, well, no, we have one who has a doctor in this room. I will assume shortly. <laughs> we have somebody who's a CPA or perhaps accountant. Well, you're, you're also well educated. That's my father. <laughs> and we're very proud of this, right? We have members who are also top surgeons in the world. We have, historically, we have members who were soldiers who were um, praised for their English and their writing as far back as like the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, which is just amazing to think that we were actually praised for our penmanship and the way we write and how we could write so, so early on, right? And a great thing about Brother Town members is that they take their own initiative to educate themselves about our culture, our history, and our language. Without these individuals who are constantly working at educating themselves and other members, we wouldn't know all of this rich history. So without the school, the Dartmouth College, what is Dartmouth now, and the encroachment of Europeans into Indian lands and the general dislike for one another between Europeans and Algonquins, our community started to shrink in size. So what Occam does by 1775 was he created a new community of brother tribes. With the continuing encroachment and precarious environment in New England and with their Euro-American neighbors, this community of seven, seven tribes made an agreement with the Oneida Nation in New York for a small portion of land that came to be known as the Town of Brothers, which is then flipped to Brother Town, how we got our name. Eventually, this area, Brother Town, became the term used to refer to the group themselves rather than the, relocation or the location or the description of the group that was living there. Essentially, we became a distinct tribe and recognized as such by our neighbors, the state of New York, and soon the federal government. And I say soon because this, this sort of move or this coming together of all these seven communities happened right in the middle of the American Revolution. So we're not even in the U.S. yet. We're not a country yet. Um, let's see, when Native American, so during the American Revolution, Native American contributions to the, to the American side is often reported as being neutral or siding opinion with the British. However, many Brother Town members fought with the Americans along with the Oneida and Tuscarora members, members, I won't say the entire tribe, it's also members for us. Um, this is astounding because why would Native groups side with the colonists? Well, they were promised a better life. But as I continue with our history, you'll see how that all turned out. So by living with and fighting alongside the Oneidas, the Brother Towns created a strong bond with them, and we were able to continue living beside, amongst, and under the protection of the Oneida, being part of the Iroquois Confederacy. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about the move we then made with the Oneidas and the Stockbridge Monkey to Wisconsin. We were sort of forced out of the New, New England, New York area, and we moved further west. So the Oneidas having more power at the time, we negotiated an agreement with the Menominee in the 
Michigan Territory, which is now in present day Wisconsin, and the state of New York for a portion of Menominee land outside of Green Bay to create a new Oneida reservation. The Oneidas promised the Brother Town a portion of this land for their own reservation, and by 1832, after more, moving four times in 60 years, the Brother Town, a group of Oneidas, and Stockbridge Muncie moved to current day Wisconsin. So the red circle around Wisconsin, or the, at least the northeast part of Wisconsin, indicates the original Menominee lands, which is also where Kelly and County resides. Um, then the Oneidas were promised to land south of the Bay of Green Bay, sort of in Brown County here. They gave, their, their land sort of went down towards Lake Winnebago, and then they gave Stockbridge and Brother Town reservations or parts of land. So the yellow dot inside of Calumet County next to Lake Winnebago is where the Brother Town sort of land is right now. And then you have the two dots up here. One is Stockbridge, Muncie, as it stands today, and the other is the Menominee tribe. So the Menominees actually have a small, small fraction of the land that they once had, as well as the Oneidas. And the Brother Town only have one acre, which we purchased, and they're very proud of this one acre. And you can see it off of Highway 53. 55. 55, thank you very much. Thank you very much. 55, we have a big sign on it. It's, it's sort of in the, you know, the triangle that forms the highways that come together. I don't know this road, I know longer with, with that's, yes. our, that's our road sign. Oh. Our land is actually just off of the water. On the other uh, side. Of the yeah. it's, a, it's a lot off of the water. Okay. Our road well, see, this is why you bring elders with you everywhere you go. Because <laughs> they correct people. Because we've got the grass. The Menominee Drive was always with the East Coast. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Menominee and, and Ho Chunk, I believe, were always in Wisconsin, but Ho Chunk is sort of on the western. Yeah. And, and the Oneida and, and Brother Town is back there. No, it's here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, if you talk to the Oneidas, they actually call it the Trail of Tears, their, their version of the Trail of Tears. So we usually know the Trail of Tears is the Cherokee moving sort of south, uh, in the south, right? But they also lay claim to this sort of title. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you. And did, uh, did the Brotherton also go to uh, Ohio first before they came? I, North, like the I believe so. Yes. That's when we were called the River Indians. We picked up that title of River Indians. Um, and that was with the um, Delaware Muncie. And the Delaware Muncie ended up in Kansas, so we were without the See, this is what happens also when you bring elders along. They know more than you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the tribes that settled or were in on, on Lake Michigan, like Kiwani, what tribe from that? There's so around Lake Michigan, especially in what is now the state of Michigan, there are a lot of Ojibwe no, tribes. In the Wisconsin side. The, the community of Kiwani, for example, was an Indian settlement. Mm -hmm. There was a big fuss, they had to rename the school. Yeah. Because they were named the Indians and somebody, else. and it was an Indian settlement. Yes. Yeah. Menominee, I know, has most of the eastern portion of Wisconsin. So if it if they were there, this was part of Waterloo. Right? They're also in the north. Yeah. If you're moving towards like the UP, the Potawatomi are up there as well. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Kiwani, um, I would say Menominee, but you could you could be right. Yes. Let me interject and maybe help. There is a great book by Patty Lowe called The Tribes of Wisconsin that explains extremely well the history of all the tribes that live in Wisconsin. There's a wonderful book. Yes, and she's got fantastic pictures, a lot of them from Wisconsin State Historical Society in here. I have read this book. Other questions? Okay. So how so now that we know that we lost all this land, I want to talk about how we sort of lost this land. And there are multiple reasons. 
And I'm going to split them up and talk first about the Citizenship Act, which leads to tax or money problems, and which was the cause of, of, of most of our land loss. So land grabs were a strategic plan made by the federal government, and ultimately the beginning of our current problem of fighting for federal recognition. So bear with me, I'm going to get slightly political, um, but it's all connected, I promise. What federal recognition means is that in the eyes of the U.S. federal government, a federally recognized tribe is seen as a dependent but domestic nation. So it's like a state. To be like a state means we can negotiate with the federal government or state governments. We have our own laws. We have our own civil servants, our police, and we govern our own citizens if you have federal recognition. It also means more taxes for the state we reside in, more revenue for the area because of businesses a federally recognized tribe can open, and social programs for the areas we reside in to support um, tribal members. So it's actually beneficial, in my opinion, prejudice, to non-native communities around it, and blocking it is not only politically and economically not um, um, strategic, but unfortunately, this happens all the time. So for the brother town, Things like governing our own citizens and even determining enrollment through criteria that we choose what our citizens should um, have and having a governing body are things that we already do and have, we have done for a long time. But unfortunately, the federal government does not want to see us as an equal, as a governing body that has the right to negotiate uh, treaties with them. This started because of the Citizenship Act of 1839, which made all brother town members the first Indians to become U.S. citizens. In addition to this, communal land was allocated to individual households, which is called allotment. And this was seen as a civilizing practice with the goal to make households responsible for small pieces of land rather than a group owning a large piece so that the household or the families on these small pieces of land can be productive and typically become farmers. Of course, with allotment and citizenship, this means that responsibility to pay taxes and for individuals who didn't have enough food to feed themselves, it was really hard to come up with the money to actually pay for the living taxes. So what ends up happening is the allotted land was taken away and became the property of the federal government. So now we're going to fast forward a century to the 1980s, over a century, when the government gives all tribes the opportunity to regain their federal recognition and this is through a petition process that includes the requirement of tracing tribal status back to a 1924 census. But remember, the brother town already became citizens in 1839. So essentially, we were stripped of our tribal status overnight. So one day we wake up as native, and then that night we go to bed as non natives. How this works, I still don't know, but we filed for recognition in the 80s and were denied on this technicality over which census if the Office of Federal Acknowledgement, or OFA, was going to, to use. So either 1924, which all tribes trace back to, or the 1839, which, which was the act that, that granted us U.S. citizenship, but stripped us of native status. <coughs> we then applied again in 2005. And in 2009, we were told, yet again, that we did not satisfy the criteria mainly because of the 1839 Citizenship Act. So terminating our sovereignty, and in, in, in 2012, the final determination of our petition was made, saying even though the federal government acknowledges our prior relationship with the U.S. government, the 1839 Act expanded us and made us, quote, non-Indian. So it took, so we petitioned in 2005, and the ruling came down in 2012, so it took seven years for this decision to be made. But my fellow brother town citizens, and I know, we don't need federal recognition, for one thing, to tell us we're native or not. So we are doing what we've always done, and continue to run like any other tribe in the U.S. And in order to regain federal recognition, we are going through what is a process of amending the U.S. Constitution which means we are waiting for the right time, the right connections, and the right bill to be added to that um, so that we can sort of repeal the 1839 Citizenship Act. So it's a bit more complicated than this, but I only have an hour and I want to interact with you and I don't want to just talk at you all the time. So we are working with our state politicians for support and the support of other groups like hopefully the Calumet Historical Society. and and. Support like this is, is necessary for this process. 
And if you want to know more about the sort of the criteria for recognition, we can talk about that afterwards. All right, something I know a lot about because it's what I do. A little bit about my position with the tribe. I am what is commonly referred to as the TIPO, or the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Each tribe in the U.S. now has created its TIPO position after the 1990 Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA. What this act does is it ensures that any federally funded institution, like at universities, museums, historical societies, etc., that receives federal money must repatriate or give back any human remains, religious items, and objects of cultural patrimony to the tribe they came from. But less common, NAGPRA also sets up press, uh, procedures for excavating in North America, as well as construction of federally funded things like highways and buildings to ensure they are not being placed over any sort of sacred site or burial site. So tribes created positions like TIPO to make sure all the repatriations go smoothly and construction companies would have someone to contact to see if plans to disturb sites that shouldn't be preserved, or disturbed, sorry. They should be preserved. They should not be disturbed. <laughs> so what I do and have done is handle connections, paperwork, and physical exchange of repatriated items with the help of a lot of people. And, and we have actually received some of these, even though we are not fully recognized, which means that NAGPRA doesn't always apply to us, but we have, in good faith, received repatriations. Um, I sort of have become one of the faces of the Tribal Cultural Division, along with some other key members who also do quite a bit of work around the state. And so I work with archaeologists who want to excavate or look into Brother Town history. We had somebody... Um, a few years ago, who was getting his dissertation, and he worked with us, and this is the book that he wrote, so you can come up and look at this. His name's Craig Sibola. He now works at a prestigious university in England, so good for him. <laughs> I wish I had his job. Um, I've also done things like I, uh, let's see, I'm currently helping a master's student who's sort of finishing up this year. She's working on a public policy piece that looks into the mental and physical health of tribal members and sort of what our tribe needs um, in terms of information about health, where to get it, you know, all of these things. So she's fantastic. And lastly, right now, um, just one more example. I also was contacted by Yale University because they have a collection of documents that includes music, written music, like hymns, that were, were written by Brother Town members and sung by Brother Town members. So what they want to do is they want to digitize this and then also have their choir sing it and record it for us, which I think is absolutely fantastic because I was a music major in a previous life 10 years ago. <laughs> and I cannot wait to hear what this music sounds like. So we're actually going to get a copy of this and you can come see it in the Brother Town Cultural Center. Um, I have the, the address up here somewhere, uh, hopefully in the next couple of years when it's finished. So I'm generally sort of like the first line of defense between our citizens and people who want to research us. And Native peoples, as a lot of us already know, have been researched more than any other racial or ethnic group in the world. So I think of my position, which is all volunteer, as it being really important, because I don't want our citizens to be exploited in any sort of way, but we also know that we need to get our faces out there, and we need to get our history and our culture out there. Um, so that's why I really enjoy what I do, um, especially talks like this. So the image up here is of our community center, commonly referred to as BINC, the Burlington Indian Nation Community Center. And it's where our government offices are. Our museum is in here. We hold gatherings, and we just had our first annual powwow. We have, we've had things that look like powwows, but this was our, like, branded as our first annual powwow on April 1st, and it looked fantastic. I was unfortunately out of the state. Were you there? It, it was. was. It was, it was the yeah, you were there. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, oh, okay. It was cool. I wish I was there. I'm jealous. Yeah. Did you dance? No, but I got to yeah, I got to a couple of people like that are really talking and interested in this. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, you're all welcome next year. It's probably going to be around the same time. It'll be the second annual. It'll go even more smoothly, I'm sure. <laughs> but we also hold bingo there every Tuesday night and every other Saturday. 
um, and other organizations actually rent out this hall for their own bingo or their own parties. So bingo staff, more than anyone else, keeps the tribe afloat, and I wish we had a couple of our bingo members here um, so that we could thank them. But if you do go to bingo every Tuesday and every other Saturday, <laughs> please thank the bingo staff because really without them we would not have such fantastic facilities, and you'll see inside the museum in a second. We also, for fishing days, have um, rent out the parking lot. Is it musky days? Walleye days. So if you are a walleye fisher on Lake Winnebago and you need a place to park, that is your place. It's right on the water. Inside, this is our museum. It was just redone by two wonderful sisters in the Fond du Lac area who put in a lot of time and energy and, and their own money to make it look fantastic and bring out all of these old pictures that we can see all around the museum. So all of these small things, pictures are hanging all over the place. You can't see behind me, but there's a wall as well, a lattice wall that's very beautiful. They have the pictures hung up strategically. So if you get a chance, please go check out the museum. Uh, we have photos and archives that you can look through. There's a kids hands-on section. Behind this, there are a bunch of photo albums at a table. Um, we like people to go through, and if you recognize anybody, to write it on one of the notes that we have there so that we can identify people. We have a veteran's wall, sort of in the back there. And there's a memorial section, it's over here, for the members that have recently passed on. It won't take you much time because it's literally just this one room, but if you do it right, you can find a plethora of information and little treasures throughout it. The address is 311 Winnebago Drive, so it's actually on this side of Fond du Lac, really close to here. Highway 55 is how you get there, now that I know. Um, and we don't have regular hours, unfortunately, for the museum. It just depends on if somebody is there to let you in. So do call ahead and set up an appointment, if possible. You can also go before bingo. You can go when we have powwows, it's always open, or gatherings, anything that we have. The museum is almost always open. We also do school groups there. I've done a group from UW-Madison, and um, it just kind of sort of fits with my schedule because I do live out of state, but we have other members who are, are well-versed in history as well. Um, and that is our phone number, 920-929-9964. Okay, sort of the last thing I would like to talk about today. Um, is our language and culture projects that we have going on. So language is important to ensure that the continuation of our culture happens for the next um, teen generations, right? We are currently trying to get a language program up and running, but as you can imagine, with seven different communities forming the brother town, picking the right language is quite difficult. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We want to make sure that it's attainable and that um, it's accessible to all of our members. So even though they are related languages under the umbrella of Algonquin languages, they are different sort of like dialects. So we think of the southern drawl, but it's also, you know, little word changes like do you say soda or do you say pop? Do you say water fountain? Do you say bubbler? Those sorts of things. So when the tribes came together, what also makes this really hard is that the common language we, sh we spoke was actually English. Um, remember, at this point, we were Christianized and have been living near and interacting with European settlers, so we all knew English, um, and it just became easy to, to speak in English. So now, I have been doing a lot of research, not only on what the languages spoken were, but how they were related, and what is the best option or most, most achievable language to pick for the brother town. In academic terms, the languages that we are dealing with are called dead languages because no one is the first language speaker of these languages. So we must re recreate every sound, every word, every sentence, every phrase from what little information we have. There are some recordings, but they're not complete, right? And we do have a dictionary, um, I believe at Brown University, that is fantastic for one of the seven languages. So it's quite a daunting task that would take full attention, and since this is all volunteer, it's a slow process. But in my opinion, the most attainable language, and I'm going on record with my tribal members here, is the Mohegan Pequot language. That is the most attainable one that we could possibly um, get. 
And we do have members who are learning this language on their own and who are sharing their knowledge with others through podcasts and Facebook pages. So technology has been wonderful all around. I don't know if you all noticed, but my computer's over here and there are a couple members who are Skyping in or Zooming in with us right now. Because we live all over the US. I lived in Germany for a little bit. I know people who live in Atlanta. There are people who live in DC. There's a group of us out on the West Coast. So we are spread out all over. We know that the language is a huge part of keeping culture going, so we are working very hard on writing grants to get a language program up and running. And my hope is to one day have a full-time school for people. How it almost has to work from here is that we teach children who will soon become adults, and they will teach the next generation of children. So the first generation of speakers are what are called second language learners. They know English first. They'll speak the whatever language we decide as their second language. And then hopefully the second and third generation speakers become the first language speakers, or they learn the native tongue before they even learn English or alongside with English. Um, and this is sort of what a lot of tribes are doing, especially the, the ones that are very successful with language revitalization programs, right? A lot of them have either elders or children who come in and speak with the young generations like babies just to get them familiarized with the sounds of the language. Um, so I want to end on teaching you two words. I'm not an expert on this language yet, <laughs> so bear with me. So I want to teach you the two things that no matter where you go in the world, you, you should probably know first. Hello and thank you. You might also want to learn where's the restroom, <laughs> but I don't even know that in, in most of the people. So, a kwai is hello, a kwai. a kwai, and then to put me is thank you, and to put me for having me here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to just show you these before I ask any questions. I have some things up here. You saw the Craig Stippola book and the Patty Lowe book. There's also a Fleming book up here that if you want to take a look at. Here is our insignia. This is my regalia. You're welcome to pick it up. But I decided to Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, feel free to come up and look at any of this stuff. This is what I made for my father. I stole it from your house today. <laughs> <laughs> so I can show it. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Oh, Greg, can I just introduce you? This was our fantastic member who gave us the wonderful um, quote at the beginning. I used your quote about your, your mom or grandma coming down here and seeing all the pictures. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. <laughs> yes. For the bullet of coming over the agricultural or the clusters or? Yeah, when we moved here, we were primarily agricultural. But when we were on the East Coast, we were primarily fishermen. Yeah. Well, there are quite a few burial mounds. I know, I know people who own land who still have quite noticeable burial mounds. And that's sacred stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially in the Midwest. We have like Cahokias in Ohio. It's huge. In the ledge area along with the Bago, there are. I, I know a man who owns some land in that area, and he says it's a very discernible burial mound of his life. Nice. And that would have been the relative. It could be, yeah. yeah, or it could be before. It could be Menominee because we were already Christian when we came here, so we actually do have oh, a Christian oh. cemetery quite early on. Okay, one more question. I want to stop that. The, uh, the burial mounds and the effigy mounds in the area are ancestors of the whole chunk. They're so they're pre whole chunk, and then the ones on the west side of the state are, are primarily whole chunk. Okay, you yes. know, I was born and raised in a farm, watched the children, and we plowed and did things the old fashioned way. We had shoe boxes, not shoe boxes, cigar boxes full of projectile points, or more correct than anything, yes. because some were actually spear signs. Mm -hmm. Uh, were those what tribes were they from? Uh, probably Bano Indians, uh, Sumian, Hochunk, 
probably, if because they're up by children. And probably also Menominee. I don't believe the Menominee is the effigy. So no. I don't no, think no. they did burial marks, but not effigy. No. So they might even be Menominee if it was. Um, I mean, a display of uh, projectile points found on our farm plan. Nice. But we had, when I was a kid, we had cigar boxes. We smoked cigars. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And in 70s and early 80s was because of the land we sold in New York. We were never paid for. In Kansas. Yeah, in Kansas. So I um I don't think when we when we accepted citizenship that there was any transfer anything other than the individual members having to pay taxes. And the drawing up of the allotments of the lots. <coughs> the reservation. Yeah. Any idea why Wisconsin and why that geographic wire? <laughs> yes. It was the Indian territory yeah. at the time? Michigan. <laughs> well, it, a lot of the natives, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm also an anthropologist. I'm, I'm not just, this is my, my field of study as well. Um, the Oneida Nation was strong and they had <coughs> connections. They mm -hmm. called the Menominee, was it Uncle? That the Menominee, the relationship between the Menominee Nation in what was at that time Michigan Territory were friends and allies of the Oneida Nation in New York. And so when um, the Elazar Wheeler was working on negotiating moving the Brothertown East, West, um, we capitalized on that relationship because we moved to Ohio because we were cousins with uh, Delaware. And then when that fell through, we picked up the other uncles that we had in, in this territory. So it's not happenstance, it's through long-term intertribal relationships that, that, that drew the brother time here. And the, one of the fascinating things that I find when you're talking about pre-contact is that tribes weren't just stationary or isolated, they all moved around and we actually had roadways, they just weren't paved, right? So we had all of these connections between tribes. 
Um, all across the country. Yeah, all across the country. Did the Brotherton come straight to this area, or did they, uh, did they make a stop in Vermont also? So, like, did they stop in Muncie? No. Oh, okay. Um, no. The, the lands were already allotted. By the time we had the early advanced group come in and, and look at it and, and settle it out with the Stockbridge, the Brothertown, and the Oneida, our elders and tribal leaders all came out and mapped and negotiated it out. And so it was Oneida, Stockbridge, Brothertown, more at the south along of uh, Lake Winnebago. <coughs> so that our, our, our leaders had already mapped it out for us. And the federal government entered into a treaty with the Menominee Nation to see that territory for Oneida, Stockbridge, Muncie, and Brothers. But I read also that the, the uh, Stockbridge were in Ghana for 10, 12 years yes. before they came yes. south. Well, yeah, they did not. That's the split to the before they came south. The Citizenship Party Act yes. came about. That was the internal split. Absolutely. Yeah. That still goes on, by the way. Just not. It's not a. It's, um, what was it painful as it was back then. I don't know. I'm trying to look for a term. That is divisive. Exactly. There you yeah. go. I have like a lack of rules the lack of community of your school teacher. What tribe did she come from? Stafford or your She was from Stafford. I think he was also a site of that You get a lot of um, artifacts or, or people donating stuff back to the tribe? Yeah, we're trying to do that um, right now. We're trying to get people to donate yes. photographs and any sort of artifacts. We have a couple. We did get a, a repatriation from the Chilton, I believe. Um, and we have a lot of um, tribal members that donate things that they, they have made, which is fantastic. We either put it in our store or we put it in our museum. Um, but mostly we have um, photographs and we have archives for um, everything, newspapers, right? We have all of our federal petition artifacts or archives in our museum. Not as many um, three-dimensional artifacts as, as a lot of tribal museums, but there are some there. We have um, a cool basket that is actually made with potato stamps, so there are designs on it. It's a, it's a woven basket, it's a black ash basket with designs stamped on that are made because of carving it into a potato and then stamping it on there. That's really special because you don't see those every day. We have um, baby moccasins that have been beaded and there was a member, I don't, I'm not quite sure who, but he made a sort of faux wampum belt that's really long that has Brother Town and it has um, the years. Um, he called me on the way here. Diggy, what's his name? Gordon Lightfoot Bay. Thank yes. you. Yeah. So we have some pretty cool things. There's also, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, wait, no. It's not very clear. But behind this table, there are also two very large wooden rocking horses that another tribal member made. Um, that's in there. Now the uh, center and museum is located in Front of us. For people who are familiar with the complex, is it like a nice salty dog or like a restaurant? Oh, it's it's, 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 yeah. it's, 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 it's it's closer to AW. It's closer to AW. It's right on the main drain. It's set off. It's yeah, it's a little center, and we have the far left portion of the strip mall. Mm -hmm. And it looks like this. <laughs> yeah. What sort of government, the governing body did the, the tribe have when they came here? We had um, five, like, I don't want to say chiefs, but they're like leaders. Because they're not technically chiefs. Yeah, they were called actually leaders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And today we have um, a democratic governing body. We have a chairman who sort of leads the leads the council, and we have a vice chair, secretary, treasurer, um, and a couple of council members that make most of the decisions. And the peacekeepers. And the peacekeepers, which we have one here today. It's they're sort of like our legal system, so if we get into a feud, Judge Judy over there. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard the, the, the brother Tony and the brother Tony. Yeah. Is it just habits? Yeah. Um, some people actually do spell it this way. Yeah. yeah. But um, officially, it's T O W N. On your very first slide, you have a beautiful word that I thought you were going to share that with us. Oh, that is the actual <laughs> name. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we yes. Yeah. 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 Here we go. Iyam Quintawakanuk. Well, it means it means brother Tom. Yeah. 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 Brother Tom. Tom and brothers. It looks a lot better on the application when you write it out like this. Yeah. I have to copy and paste. I have it on my desktop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we actually just sort of adopted this not too long ago, putting it on everything because when I was growing up, we just did it. So it's one of those revitalization efforts that we're doing to try and get as much of the language into every day. So. Well, when they uh, decided to come together, that's when you said they all spoke English, so that was for common thread. Yeah. Because I was wondering what it was meaning. We're all, yeah. They have these different tribes and they have all different languages. Yeah. They, they're they're similar, similar languages that they could speak to each other languages. and understand, um, sort of like, um, Today it would be British English, <laughs> um, but English was definitely, by the time they came together to form the, the brother town, it was English. And we were all related in some way prior to that. We're all cousins. We're all like, you know, um, brothers. It's so where did that word come from? How was oh. that? I have no idea. It's a vocation word. So we just, we created it? That's a fantastic question. No, actually, Samson Volcom wrote that. That's, oh. that's how we know it's more deep because he wrote that. <coughs> we actually have a tribal member. I don't know if she's on Zoom right now, but um, she's trying to recreate Samson Volcom's trip to England and through England, which would be fantastic. He only has a very small number of letters that she's working off of, but so far she's She's been able to do with some really great things. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any um, museums or places out east that you know about the United that will carry your history? Yeah, a lot of the universities out there. So Dartmouth has a lot of stuff. Brown has a lot of stuff. And then um, there are still tribes out there like National Center Pequot. They have a, a very, very large, prestigious museum out there. Um, yeah. We also have the grave sites of Sansom Akam. I have a picture on here. But you, you can also go and actually see these areas as well. There's yeah. also a place in Massachusetts called uh, Ulster Ridge Village. And the, uh, the old uh, Indian doctors is uh, uh, modeled after you left a road uh, who were descended directly from. Yeah, Mark Ruchak played her for years. Nice. And, so that's a living history museum. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Is there, um, I have an understanding of an, a group of uh, tribes that like the Potawatomis were supposedly the keepers of the flame. Yeah, they're the keepers of the fire, yeah. Is there, a, like, was each tribe responsible for a certain part of the mm -hmm. government? Of the, when you're looking the, into like Ojibwe and Potawatomi history, yeah, um, they have that, or even Oneidas, like, I know they have three clans in Oneida, and so one is like, the medicine clan wants the, the, I don't want to say intellectual, but like thinkers of the knowledge. Yeah, thank you, keepers of the knowledge. And then you have <laughs> sort of like the, all these tropes. I don't want to say warrior, but like, you know what I'm saying. They're like the protectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, they were split up. Each, each group had a responsibility over and above just the general like, living people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. A lot of tribes do that. And it, it's usually less. 
So people are watching it 24 seven to make sure it doesn't go out for usually about a week. Mm -hmm. Other question? When are you graduating? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little scatterbrained if you if you don't know me, but this is me scatterbrained because I um, I'm getting my doctorate. This is my, this is my side job <laughs> that I have to pay for. My real job is is getting a doctorate in anthropology, and I got a job that starts in the fall. So instead of having a whole year to finish my dissertation, I have a month and a half to. <laughs> Get in there and write. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It'll be done. She does now. What's that? So that you can support yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except for stealing my stuff that I give to me <laughs> to show. <laughs> I'm giving it back. <laughs> Last time, any questions? Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. 